Hello, this is Greg Allison from Green Greg's Garden and Worm Farm. And I got to tell you, my mind is blown by Yellowstone. Oh, my God. Yellowstone is doing crazy stuff. Now, we all know that Yellowstone is a super volcano. At least I hope you know this. And super volcanoes have a long-term threat to the, to the prosperity of civilization. I mean, their civilization ending events if they go off at full scale. Um, they can be an extinction-level event. For humanity. Uh, a super volcano going off would be a, an extremely bad nightmare. And we're going to go into it in a minute. Now, the thing about Yellowstone is we have known that since about 2015, that the magma has been rising inside the chamber. It has a huge lower chamber that's just colossal. It goes down like hundreds of miles. And it's got this upper chamber. The upper chamber of Yellowstone has enough molten magma in it. Now, everything in there is not molten, but there's enough molten magma in there, I mean, this thing's huge, to fill the Grand Canyon 11.2 times. They thought two times once upon a time. Now they discovered it's got a lot more. 11.2. The Grand Canyon is huge. If you've never been there, you have no concept for how big that thing is. I've stood on the side of that thing at 7,000 foot up and looked down at what looked like little hills down there. And I realized these little hills I'm looking way down at are bigger than what we call mountains around here where I live. This thing is huge. That's a lot of magma. If it's underground, it's magma. When it comes up, it's lava. But what blows my mind about it is this. Uh, we have had an increase in one day in some of the springs and rivers around Yellowstone of 10 degrees. Excuse me, it's winter outside. It's not warming from the outside, it's warming from the inside, from Mama Earth, from the magma chamber. Don't you love that word, magma? But in any event, we want the magma to stay magma, not lava, as long as we can. The thing about Yellowstone is, she goes off. She has gone off with a regularity of about once every 600,000 years, except now it's been 640,000 times. I mean, for the large explosions, like B, I believe it's eight, for the, for the largest volcanic explosions. Uh, now, she has had smaller eruptions, that's true, but it's been, I don't know, maybe over 80,000 years since a small eruption. Here's what I worry about. A lot of people don't talk about this when they say, well, maybe the next one will be a, a smaller eruption. In volcanoes, they get plugged. If they don't go off for a while, they get plugged. Being plugged means pressure builds. It's when it's plugged and pressure builds, what happened to Kraken Toa? It was plugged. What happened to Matt St. Helens? It was plugged. They went boom. You know, the entire island of Krakatoa exploded uh, in Indonesia. So, and that's maybe what happens at Yellowstone. It has the super called Derek explosions. That's the one we don't want to see. We don't want to see any of those. They're all bad news coming out of Yellowstone. It's just so big. Yellowstone has two. Most volcanoes, when they've got yeah, magma built them, have a resurgent dome. Yellowstone has two resurgent domes. Like I said, they've been building uh, for the last four years, steadily rising. Uh, gases are coming out, more gases. Uh, the entire uh, area around the, the, the um, hot... Um, Geysers is head up, heated up the geyser basin. But the thing that really impressed me, what prompted me to do this video, now I've been planning to do a video and, and do a little more research and be more in depth about it, but just the suddenness of a 10 degree in one day temperature rise. And this occurred, this temperature spike occurred in uh, Firehole River at Old Faithful. Firehole River, I guess further down at, uh, uh, at the Yellowstone, uh, West Yellowstone, okay, mountain or something like that. I've never been there myself. And also there's a Madison River, huge temperature increases. So uh, 10 degrees Fahrenheit jump is a fair increase in temperature. So, um, and another thing that is really disturbing about Yellowstone, the USGS, uh, US Geological, can we talk today? It's really late. US Geological Service really don't uh, update the sensors. They're not really reporting a lot of the earthquakes. One of the best sources of news, and there's several good sources of news and people on YouTube that will tell you about the regular goings on at Yellowstone. 
One of the best sources that I like to go to is Mary Greeley. Go to marygreeley.news. Just search for it on YouTube. Subscribe to her channel. She'll take you through all the details of all the tilt meters, earthquakes, uh, gases, spectrograms. She's very thorough and very scientific. She knows what she's talking about and what she talks about and the long-term trend of what she's telling us. It's concerning. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that we'll ever see Yellowstone go off, and I hope we never do. But she is about 40,000 years overdue. So let me just show you a few little charts here. I'm going to make this a long video, uh, hopefully not like my other two. But, um, yeah, let me, uh, this is a chart I made back in 2006 for a conference. It's a part of a much bigger presentation about human destiny and the purposes of why we need to get off this rock. And I now I don't know if we got enough time, but uh, so this is going into the fact that there was a super volcano explosion 74,000 years ago. The, the geneticists couldn't figure it out, but they had determined that there was a bottleneck in the genetics of the human race that suggested that the human race got winnowed down to about 2,000 individuals at that time frame. They couldn't figure it out until they found the evidence that the super volcano Toba had gone off at that time. Now, there's people debate this. People debate everything, fight about and argue about any topic you bring up. But the evidence strongly suggests this is what happened. You can post whatever you want. Whatever you want to say about a super volcano going off is somewhat less than the best day you could ever expect. Okay, can you accept that at least? So, <laughs> you know, when you have a caldera open up 18 by 60 miles, Toba's not the biggest super volcano out there, mind you. Um, so if you look at, uh, you know, Toba's eruption was uh, 2,800 cubic kilometers of ash and rock, you know, as opposed to a kilometer from Mount St. Helens. So um, let's see if I can get this thing to scroll here. There we go. For some reason, my PowerPoints are not wanting to scroll today. This chart shows, and I'm going to run my cursor around here. Uh, we're all, this is the, uh, three of these are Yellowstone, and one of them is uh, Long Valley, California. Oh, by the way, the Long Valley cal caldera is filling with magma, too. We always talk about Yellowstone. Long Valley is filling. That's scary. And this one's Long Valley, so it has a fairly good uh, capability of exploding. These are the Yellowstone calderic explosions. You can see they're quite large in volume. That's what this ball has meant. By comparison, this is Mount Pinatubo. We all remember Mount Pinatubo really shut down an Air Force base, run a lot of people out of the Philippines, and we had uh, really orange skies for about a year, at, and beautiful sunsets after Pinatubo went off. You know, hey, like I tell my buddies, there is a silver lining around every mushroom cloud. <laughs> yeah, that is kind of rough. But uh, this little thing here, that little dot, that's Mount St. Helens. Compare that over here. Huge difference. That's why I'm showing you this. So um, this is a USGS chart showing the uh, uh, Yellowstone area and showing the various uh, calderas where uh, this thing has gone off in the past. This is the present location right here of the caldera itself. What's a caldera? It's the hole left when everything collapses back in after the thing goes off. It's like a depression, a basin. And it's so big that you wouldn't even, you, you stand on one side of this and you don't see the rim of the other side. This thing is huge. You know, this is the corner of Wyoming up here for Pete's sake, Montana up here, Idaho over here. So these things are not trivial, my friends, not at all trivial. You know, these things could plunge us into a uh, nuclear winter. Excuse me, I'm going farther than I wanted to go in this presentation. Let's see. There you go. Now the buttons are working. But um, suffice it to say that we do not want to see this thing go off, but we have no control over it. When it decides to go off, there's nothing we can do about it. What we do know is that volcanic activity has a history 
of dramatically increasing during grand solar minimums. And I mentioned in another video on uh, um, the day that, that I just did that um, grand solar minimum cycles are about 400 years. But it, there are longer cycles, and there's a lot of indicators that suggest we may be in something like a 2,000-year or even longer cycle for grand solar minimums, which suggests that we may see a lot more volcanic activity, which means if there's some volcano that's really on the edge, if that's where Yellowstone's at, it may have a greater inclination to go pop. Let's hope it goes fizz instead of pop. But if that cap is really tight down because it hadn't gone off in a long time, everything is plugged and sealed up, which seems to be the case, you know, how much pressure can build up before it vents? That's the question. And I don't have the answers. Nobody really knows this. I mean, people can pontificate and talk and talk and tell you this and tell you that, and show you analysis. Don't mean a darn thing. What you got to know is it can go bad. And what does this mean for us? I just talked to, to you about nuclear winter from Pakistan and, uh, and India potentially having a conflict. I've talked about grand solar minimum that might freeze us off. You know, there's, there's, there's many things that might hit, and this is the other one. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be able to prepare. We got to be able to grow our own food. But during these periods, we want to have to store food and save seed so that we can grow on the other side. Right now, if you're not growing food, you need to be practicing and developing your skills so you'll know how to do it when you got the chance to do it again. That may not be available for a little while, but learn how to grow food. Practice, get the skill set down. It takes years to develop these skills and know how to do things so that you won't have to have fertilizers and pesticides. That's how most people garden today. They can't garden without that. I mean, you can garden without that stuff, but the key things is organic uh, gardening and one of the best keys for that's growing worms. And I do sell worms, so you can see my link below for that. Uh, Green Greg's Garden and Worm Farm, which, or you can just go to greengregs.com. But I'm going to show you, um, let's see, we'll do another share here. We're going to go in here and look at um, uh, one other thing here. Bam. Let's see if I can make this big. Excuse me. Oh, I hadn't unshared the other thing. Oh, it's still there. That's odd. Anyway, so um, my Patriot Supply is a great source for food storage. And look what all they have here. Just look at the stuff scrolling through here. All kind of food vaults and discounts. And uh, you got emergency food, long storage, short storage, different sizes. You can buy it in cans. Look here. Here's an ammo can worth. Uh, if we scroll down, if you look at the prices, look, deep discounts. I mean, and you can get this stuff for like two dollars a meal. It's amazing stuff. Uh, you can get a three month supply. There, you can come in here and you can find a year supply, one month supply. Like I said, the ammo cans that you can carry with you. Uh, but you really can't carry a whole lot of food with you. That's where you need seed if you have to bug out. Hopefully, if we have a situation like this, you can find a good place to bug in or set you up some caches and storage areas. But uh, the cool thing about uh, my Patriot Supplies, they really cover everything. You get water filtration, heirloom seeds. I mean, my friends, 50% off seeds, uh, herb seeds. Herbs are going to be the key because you're not going to have medicines. You need to learn how to use herbs and live medicine seeds for sprouting, which you can use for microgreen seeds. Look at all these vegetable seeds down through here. The heirloom seeds are seeds that you can replant. Hybrid seeds uh, and GMO seeds, which are typically hybrid, you don't replant them. Uh, because you're not going to get back the same plant that grew the first time. Heirloom seeds are the ones you can save the seeds from and plant generation after generation after generation. And that is what you need. And in fact, you need to save in your own seeds and keep replanting your own seeds and get them cultured to the climate where you're at so they go more optimal in your growing conditions. So that's a key thing to garden, one of the tips I'll give you. So, uh, hey, prep, blowout, special deals. But, hey, there's, the other stuff is all discounted. This is great stuff. It's good food. You can get it if you buy it in bulk for, like, $2 a day. I mean, $2 a meal. Then we're going to get meals for $2 a meal. This is great. So um, let me stop this share and come back here. And uh, what I got to say is this. 
there's a whole lot of stuff out there that could really clean our clocks. There's a lot of things that could just make you go nuts. You've got to prepare your mind so that you're not just going to really lose it. You know, my mind's blown, but I don't have to lose it. It don't have to be gone just because it's blown. I'm going to stay and on my own. Uh, okay, so I'm not a career rapist. <laughs> um, listen, as long as you have breath in your lungs, you have hope. You have a chance. Well, you have to keep hope in your heart, too. You got to be mentally strong, spiritually strong. You got to know what can come so it don't put you in a state of shock, but and prepare your family for it and be able to hunker down as necessary. If you live uh, within 100 miles of Yellowstone, you need to be, I wouldn't be hanging around. I'd be keeping an eye on, right now, my, I would be keep, keeping a close eye. Temperature going up 10 degrees one day. Maybe it'll go down. Maybe it'll be fine. Maybe it'll be another 100,000 years before it fizzles and it'll just fizzle and nothing happens. I don't know. But Steamboat Geyser sits, you know, you just go off just once every so many years and spend a long time not going off for several years. And then last year, it had a record number of eruptions, throwing big rocks out. And all these geysers have started chunking rocks and trash out. And, uh, and this went off several times this year already. So things are cooking. So maybe if you're in the area, you ought to be booking. That's what I would be thinking. I would be slinking, skating backwards to get out of there. Uh, anyway, keep your head on the swivel and your eyes open because there's a lot of things that can come against us these days and it's just crazy as much as coming up at once. And that's why I did all these videos here uh, suddenly is because it's, it's a bit alarming. It's disconcerting, but you can prepare. So don't be scared. Be prepared. Save the food, know how to grow and acquire your own food, how to purify your water. You, without water, you can't live but three days. And I'm going to be covering a lot of videos on this channel. I'm, I'm going to cover more stuff about what you've got to be aware of, the things that can come at you. So you won't be just taken a guess and surprised so that you can prepare for the kind of stuff that's going to come at you. And I've got some other things to tell you about, like solar flares. I've talked about EMP, CMEs. Uh, there's a lot of discussion now about micronovas from the sun. That's about the scariest thing I could think about. Uh, but we can prepare for that too. If that's the case, I said, if that's the case, if that's something we have to face, we can't prepare. We just got to understand what it is. So I'll go into that and many other things. I'm going to show you how to grow your own food, how to not have to go to the store to buy fertilizer because you're raising worms, how to grow indoors, outdoors, greenhouse, aquaponics, uh, raised bed, you know, old fashioned, no tech, low tech, high tech, in tech, out tech, uh, many ways. And you know what? Actually, growing food gives you a sense of satisfaction to grow things, to see something you produce with your hands, to see life. You know what's in it, you know what you're getting, you know your family's getting good food. It's just so beneficial. And uh, that's why you need to stay on board. And so the thing is, to survive requires a wide range of knowledge, capabilities, and that's what I want to teach you. A lot of people don't like YouTube channels that cover more than one little niche. And I have a lot of people bugging out. You know, they'll, they'll sign on for one topic, and as soon as I diverge off to show something else, they should be paying attention to because it could help them. They go, ah, they bug out and unsubscribe. Well, hang on your pants and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Click the update notification bell because I'm going to teach you what you need to know to survive and thrive in the worst of times. And hopefully we can form communities and find satisfaction and value in our company, our shared resources and knowledge. I have a concept for a home that we can live in, make a living out of, got almost no environmental footprint, and that home concept I have will be robust. It can stand up to a lot of this stuff. It's going to be awesome. So stay tuned. Again, subscribe and click the update notification bell. And thank you for watching.